Good morning. Welcome to worship with us today. Please know that whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here at First Congregational United Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We are delighted that you joined us today, either here in the sanctuary or by live stream. The liturgy is projected on the front screen. The bulletin is also available by scanning the QR code found at any of the entrances on your mobile device. This Sunday, we celebrate the work of the Prison Ministry Project. In the 17 years of this project, under the leadership of Reverend Jerry Hancock, Reverend Hancock and the many volunteers have done the work of ministering to those who are imprisoned and advocating for justice for those who interact with the judicial and correction systems. We are grateful for the time, energy, and commitment by those who volunteer in the programming of the project and to those who offer financial support. So this ministry can do the work we are called to do as Christians. Let us now enter our time of worship together. Please stand and body your spirit for this morning's call to worship. Gracious God, 
We give thanks for the opportunity to hear the stories of others. Both inside and outside prison walls. Prison walls that others make for us. And prison walls we make for ourselves. Hearing the stories of others reminds us how common we are. And how unique we are. How connected we are. As we worship together, we give thanks for the gift of Jesus, common but unique, whose story continues to connect us all. Amen. May the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Please wave to your neighbor. Please join me in our unison prayer. God of justice and mercy, in the darkness of prisons, in our own lives and the lives of others, let us together light one candle for the strength we need to never become our own foes. Light one candle for those suffering the pain we see and cannot forget. Light one candle for all we believe in, that justice will somehow prevail. Light one candle to bind us together and let our light shine. Amen. We now invite all the children to come forward. Come on up to the steps, have a seat. And while the kids are coming up, reminder to families, next Sunday, right after worship, we have our family service project. We're going to be making uh, uh, Valentine's Day cards for elders in the congregation and area nursing homes. So all are ready. Please sign up on Realm. I need to know how much pizza to order. So, all right. It is so great to see all of you today. 
So great to see all of you. Now, I'm going to ask you to put your thinking caps on because we're going to think a little bit today. Okay? So, and you don't have to raise your hands. Don't raise your hands. Has any, <coughs> have any of you maybe done something wrong at one time? Or maybe gotten in trouble? You don't have to raise your hands. That's okay. <laughs> or maybe you got in trouble for something at home or at school. Okay? So when that happens, when you, when you do something, maybe you did it on purpose or maybe it was an accident and something happens, I um, mean, you do so something wrong and you get in trouble, what are some things that happen? What are some of the consequences? Evelyn? Um, uh, people are angry at you. People are angry at you. Okay. You might feel really bad and you didn't mean it, okay? Well, I, I want to bring up something. I have a picture here. Maybe you could tell me what that is. Who can, who can tell me what that might be? Tavi? A chair. It's a chair. What might this chair be used for? When somebody maybe had a hard time, they messed up with something. Alexa? A timeout chair, right. Now, you don't have to raise your hands. But think about how many of you maybe had an experience with a timeout chair, okay? Now, I, I, we didn't have a timeout chair. I don't know, maybe they weren't invented. I'm so old. But what, can somebody explain to me, how does a timeout chair work? How does a timeout chair work? Micah? Um, so, like, if you do something uh, against the rules of the place. Do something against the rules, okay. Okay, I'm going to say that again so everybody under, can hear what you said. So if you break the rules, you have to be, go to the chair for a certain amount of time to be excluded from the family or whatever, right? Okay, so and, and how long do you have to sit in that chair? How, Evelyn? Uh, it depends on what you did. Sometimes it's a short time, sometimes it's a couple hours. Okay, sometimes it's a short time, sometimes it's a long time. Okay, so the question is, when your time, okay, a certain time is allotted, and when that time is done, then, then what happens? Do you have to sit there forever, or do they lock you in the basement, or what, what happens after that? What happens, Ellis? Then they let you out. Then they let you out, okay. All right, so my question for you is, when you're on that chair, do you, your parents may not be happy with you, but when you're sitting in the timeout chair, do your parents still love you? Yes, of course they do. They may not be happy with you, but they still love you, even when you're sitting in the timeout chair. Okay? And then when, the, when you're done with the timeout chair and they let you get off the chair, do they love you then? Right. Okay. And then is your time then done? for that thing, let's say you smacked your sister or something like that, okay? And, and that's not a good thing, so you have to sit there, and then, and then you're, you're done, right? You can go on with your life until the next thing that you do where you go on the chair again, right? You but you don't have to stay there forever. Exactly right. Well, it's bad when, then, like, you, you, you get it every day because what if you had to drink or go to the bathroom? Right, if you had a drink or go to the bathroom, right. Exactly right. So, but when you're done, when your time is done, you're done, right? Okay. So, when we're going to talk a little bit about this, actually in Sunday school, where Jesus talks about when people have done things that are wrong, and they may be in their timeout chair, God still loves them, just like your parents. You don't have a timeout chair? Okay. Okay, people have different things. You're right. Okay. But the important thing is, when you're on that timeout chair, God still loves you. Your parents still love you. And when your time is done, then you move on. Something to remember when your next time you're sitting in the timeout chair, your parents still love you. They may not be happy with you right then, but they still love you. And when your time is up, it's your chance to move on and do better things. All right, let's, let's pray. <sighs> Thank you, God, for your patience with us. Though we try really hard, sometimes we do things that are wrong or against the rules, and we know that we have to spend some time in the timeout chair. Help us to take that time to remember you and always know 
that you love us at all times. And then when we're done with the timeout chair, we have another opportunity to do great things in your name. Amen. All right, so pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, first graders, you can go up to room 301. Teacher will be up there. Just wait down here. Okay, grades two through six, I'll meet you in the chapel for music time. All right, let's go to Sunday school. Thank you. Good morning. The two stories in this morning's text are the bookends of our prison ministry. The Luke text is the familiar parable of the Good Samaritan, in which Jesus uses the story of a crime victim to expand our definition of who is our neighbor. The Matthew text is the to-do list for Christians. Work to care for the sick, the hungry, the homeless, and the prisoner. Jesus is saying we need to care for both the victim and the criminal. We're called, we are called to do that because in his life, Jesus was both. The first story is a familiar one, but very definitely worth repeating. The scripture is from Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down by that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan was traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spent. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to this man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. The second reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 34 through 40. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you 
from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Lance Fieser. And I'm Amber Noggle. A convicted murderer is trying to achieve parole this month, but family members of the victim are horrified at the prospect. Tina Keller was killed in Beloit in 1994. As Tony Galley reports, for some, the trauma of the homicide has continued for years. When Beloit's Tina Keller was killed by her husband in 1994, it broke many hearts. How hard was it for you to lose your sister? Very, very hard very, very hard. Um, I wanted her to stay. She, I lost everything. She's like my best friend. And, you know, she was, she was everything to me. Tina Keller's killer, Randall Keller, is up for parole this month. And as much as he's been denied parole before, Tammy Elliott and Keller's three children, who were five, six, and seven when he murdered their mother, are worried and objecting to any release. Because they fear for their life and they got kids and they fear for their kids' life. Has he made threats uh, against you or his children or other family members over those 28 years? Um, not that I am aware of. And he still tries to control and manipulate everybody. The public library still has newspaper clippings of Tina Keller's shooting death. Elliot says the murder is not forgotten, especially by those children's survivors. A court recently granted two of them restraining orders against their father as they brace for his possible parole. Tina Elliott says any rehabilitation by Randall Keller is dwarfed by what happened 28 years ago to her sister. It was just terrible. She was my everything. She was my everything. Tony Galley, 27 News. Thank you for joining us. I'm Amber Noggle. We've told you about family members of a Beloit murder victim urging state officials not to parole her killer. Tonight, that killer's pastor says he believes this man should be given a chance to be in the community. Tony Galla reports on what happened in 1994 and what's happening now. It is miles and miles from some of the prisons Randall Keller has served time in, but the pastor of Madison's First Congregational Church says this place is the convicted killer's faith community, and the pastor says Keller's commitment to his faith is serious. This is not a trivial connection. This is not, uh, not a foxhole conversion. Pastor Jerry Hancock says he's ministered to Keller for 15 years. I would see him one-on-one -on -one for Bible study. Keller is trying to gain parole 28 years after he fatally shot his wife, Tina, leaving three young children without a mother in Beloit. Tina Keller's sister says 28 years is not enough. Because he's still controlling. He is still controlling. He still tries to control and manipulate everybody. I've seen a different part of Randall Keller. 
28 years ago. I, Randall Keller, am not a bad person. Keller made the case at his sentencing, he stresses again, so many years later. Keller's parole decision was to have been made just before a midterm election that's often focused on crime. The decision is now expected to come later this month. In Madison, Tony Galley, 27 News. The parole decision lies with the commission chair. His predecessor support for releasing a convicted killer led to his removal by Governor Evers. In that case, the victim's family members said they'd been given no notice of the man's planned release. This Sunday is the 17th anniversary of the Prison Ministry Project. In those 17 years, in the name of this church, we've become a leader in criminal justice reform. We've successfully protested the use of solitary confinement in Wisconsin prisons. We've rallied at the Capitol. We've demonstrated in front of prisons. Hundreds of volunteers have met hundreds of men and women inside the walls. More than a thousand men and women have graduated from our restorative justice and odyssey programs. Now these are all good actions of which we can be proud. But they're all actions that have been done by another well-intentioned social justice group. So why us? Why us? What makes this a ministry of First Congregational Church? When Randy Keller murdered his wife, he left behind three kids, ages five, six, and seven. After 28 years in prison, he's now eligible for parole. The parole board will decide if he deserves a fair chance at another chance in life. When he committed the murder, he left behind his children, a devastated extended family, and a traumatized community. After 28 years, that grief, devastation, and trauma are still very real. We saw all that in the news clip. Those kids, now grown adults, that extended family, that community, are our neighbors. The story of the Good Samaritan, one of the foundations of our faith, is focused on the victim of a crime. The gospel requires that we stand with Randy Keller's victims. So why was I, a minister of this church, standing in this sanctuary, arguing for Randy Keller's release from prison, arguing for his release over the objections of his family. I was in the sanctuary arguing for Randy Keller's release because the story of the Good Samaritan is not the only place in the gospel where Jesus talks about crime and criminals. In the story from Matthew that Barb read, we're commanded, not just encouraged, but commanded to care for prisoners. It's on the to-do list for Christians, along with feeding the hungry, caring for the sick, and sheltering the homeless. Jesus commands us to treat prisoners as we would treat him. For us, as Christians, caring for victims and caring for prisoners is not either or, it's both and. Let me tell you what I know about Randy Keller. I first met Randy at the medium security prison at Fox Lake 15 years ago. 10 years ago, members of this church worshiped with Randy at a Christmas Eve service in the prison chapel. He was a member of our first restorative justice program at the prison. In that program, we brought victims, offenders, and the community together 
to begin to heal the harm caused by crime. Randy was deeply moved by the stories he heard from crime victims, including the granddaughter of a murder victim. And he developed a deeper level of empathy for his victims. After completing the program, he tried several times to reconcile with his children. Those efforts could never work because the grief was still too deep. For many years, Randy was the prison clerk for the chaplain at Fox Lake Prison, Chaplain Deborah Mayhar, who is here with us this morning. I've seen Randy for one-on-one -on -one pastoral visits while he's been in prison. And 12 years ago, he joined this church. His mother and sister have worshiped in this sanctuary. He's made regular contributions from his prison wages, which never, which never exceeded 45 cents an hour. He gets the tower. Through the years, this church has bought him books, magazine subscriptions, and a typewriter that he needed for college. He is a faithful member of our church family. He has also had a series of hearings with the parole board, and I've listened to recordings of those hearings. His family has been adamant in opposing his release. They make it very clear who Randy Keller was in 1994. The question for the parole board is who Randy Keller is now. Which brings us to Tough on Crime. For more than a generation, politicians left, right, and center have understood that nothing motivates voters more than fear. Not education, not health care, not the economy. Fear is what works best. Make people afraid and promise to keep them safe by locking up criminals and throwing away the key is a winning strategy. Just ask Ron Johnson, who used stories like that of Randy's family to win re-election. The shorthand for the strategy is tough on crime. The success of that strategy has led to a 300% increase in the Wisconsin prison population in the last 25 years. And because part of making people afraid is making them afraid of the other, the majority of people in Wisconsin prisons are black, brown, and red. Once you get elected using tough on crime, you can never go back because you know better than anyone the consequences of being soft on crime. But the tough on crime strategy relies solely on mass incarceration, making people believe that locking up more people for more time will keep their communities safe. That is demonstrably not true. For example, Minnesota locks up only about half, only about half as many people as Wisconsin. But we don't feel endangered when we go to Rochester, the Boundary Waters, or the Twin Cities. So here we are. Here we are, stuck in the middle. The Gospel of Luke in the story of the Good Samaritan says we should care for victims of crime. And Ron Johnson wins re-election by subverting the message of the Good Samaritan and being tough on crime. The Gospel of Matthew says we should care for the prisoner. Now, no matter how compelling the tough on crime argument is, we must reject that argument because as Christians, we are committed to the whole Gospel. It's who we are. We will care 
for the victims of crime. We will care for the prisoner in ways that keep our community safe. We'll do that. We will do that by telling both sides of the story. That's why I was in this sanctuary asking for a convicted murderer and a member of our church to be released from prison. Amen. Now we enter into a time of prayer together. I will offer the pastoral prayer, then we will be in silent prayer, taking our personal joys and concerns directly to God because we know God hears all prayers. Then we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, when we pray to you, we are in awe of the knowing you are listening. We approach you today as humble servants. No egos, no clanging bells. We want to serve, and we know that that includes serving survivors of crimes, survivors of sins, survivors of ourselves. None of us want to be judged by the worst thing we have ever done, and we want to offer, to, we want to offer you and your forgiveness to all survivors, including ourselves. You are mighty and merciful. You are God. We are not. We thank you in advance for strength, peace, and that little peek we get to see in someone's life that you are working on. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
we want to pray the Lord's Prayer in words most familiar to you. <clears throat> Our Father, create heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we celebrated Epiphany this last week, we are reminded in our sacred texts about the Magi bringing gifts to celebrate the birth of Jesus. This newborn would ultimately challenge those in power and would bring a new sense of inclusivity, love, and forgiveness, a gift to the Magi and the world. The Magi remind us that we don't give gifts because they are expected or even from guilt. We give gifts as a way to celebrate and make possible the work Jesus exemplified in the world. Gifts can be made via the website, through Realm, by mail, or left in the black boxes near the exits.
Let us pray. Gracious God, grant us the wisdom to use these gifts so that your will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. Remind us as we use these gifts that we are under grace, not law. Amen. Know this, as you go forth from this place, God loves us, and we are called to love each other. God forgives us, and we are called to forgive each other. Go in peace. Amen. <laughs>